Regional School Committee at 6.32 p.m. on Tuesday, April 6th. And we will begin by a roll call attendance. Mr. Demling? Demling present. Mr. Harrington? Harrington present. Ms. Kenny? Kenny present. Um, Ms. Lord? Lord present. Ms. Seeger? Seeger present. Uh, Ms. Stancer? Stancer present. And McDonald present. I'm not seeing Ms. Spitzer or Mr. Sullivan. It's like, oh. Um, Ms. Spitzer, are you are you present? I am. So I'm just having some connectivity issues. Present. Awesome. Great. Thanks. Um, so we are in order, um, and we are joined um, this evening by our. Um, new student rep, um, Ms. Ruby Kane, welcome. And also assistant superintendent uh, Doreen Cunningham and of course, Dr. Morris and um, uh, Ms. Sharkis is our uh, minutes taker. Our first item is to approve our minutes and um, welcome Mr. Sullivan. So we have minutes um, from our January 14th meeting um, with the APEA Executive Board and um, the minutes from our joint meeting with Union 26 and then our uh, meeting alone on March 23rd. So I will um, note, I think on, um, Jan the January 14th notes I noticed on the top of page two, where it said open floor. Um, uh, Ms. Mangala, I think it's, uh, I, I think that her last name is misspelled. Um, and I think, and her role is APEA Unit A co chair, not universal co chair. Ms. Seeger and then Ms. Stancer. I noticed that on the March 23rd meeting, I'm not listed as in attendance. Uh, and I'm there because I'm also in the minute, or I'm, I have comments in there. So. Ms. Stancer. Ms. Stancer, you're muted. Sorry. Um, I just have two typos on page three of the um, January meeting. Uh, the paragraph that starts Miss McDonald thanked. Um, if you go down, it says in collaboration with, I think it should be with just minor thing. And then uh, where was I? Um, on the first page of the March 23rd minutes, Mr. Menino, the, the paragraph that starts Mr. Menino, I think it should be an actively works to seek feedback, not seed feedback. Mm. On that same um, note, on the same page, up just above that, Ms. McDonald described that we are, um, it, it, instead of continuing to expand, I think it said we are um, considering to extend. Mm -hmm. And I also think um, for the attendance list, I wonder if it might be helpful to, instead of separating out Regional School Committee and Union 26, just list the names and then in parentheses say which committees they are members of, because, um, but I believe Ms. Um, Sarah Hall is was in attendance and she's not listed. Ms. Kenny? Um, so on January 14th, I was not there, but my name is on there. And on March 23rd, I was there, but my name is not on there. Um, and then I think um, also on the 23rd, I don't think Sarah was there. Okay. 
I, I don't think she can come that day. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> on the 23rd, also under item nine, which I can't see a page number, sorry. So under number nine, school committee announcements, Ms. Lord, I think commented is correct, not commended. Are there any other edits that folks are seeing? Um, seeing none, then um, I will make a motion that we approve the minutes uh, as amended of January 14th and March 23rd, 2021. Is there a second? Second. Moved by McDonald, then second by Spitzer, and it is a roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Um, Ms. Kenny. Uh, oh, I have, I wasn't here on the 14th, so should I not vote on that one? Oh, yep, yeah, sorry. So, um, one abstain oh, well. and one yay. <laughs> Uh, should we amend the, Dr. Morris? Uh, so the, the train has left the station, so you got to just plow through the vote. Okay. Yeah, and I was going to say you are able to vote on minutes even if you weren't there, as long as you believe them to be accurate and you have no reason to believe that they were misrepresented the meeting. Oh, okay. Well, then, sure. Yay. <laughs> um, Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Aye. Ms. Bitter? Aye. Mr. Sullivan? I, I, I didn't catch that. Um, I think you might be muted. Uh, Sullivan, aye. And McDonald's, aye. Um, the motion passes unanimously. Oh, Miss Stancer, sorry. Stancer, aye. Thank you. The motion passes. My cheat sheet is out of date, so that's why I'm like, everybody's out of order. So I apologize. Um, but the motion passed uh, nine uh, to zero. And now uh, we'll move on to public comment. And as mentioned, there's um, there is no written comment this evening. Um, and we did note that on the website. So in case you go looking for it, you'll know that um, it's, it's, we don't have any, but we do have some uh, voice message comments. Um, and I will play those now. Um, I'll note that this first one, the very first one that I'm playing um, was received um, two weeks ago, actually almost three weeks ago. And I neglected to play it two weeks ago when we met. So I apologize to the commenter um, and I am playing that this evening. I'm a Richard Rutter. I go to Amherst and to ARHS. I know that this has been put out of many people's minds because of the pandemic, but it's really important to me that when we go back to school, we have adequate access to period products. I get a period every month. Most people who have periods understand that they're far from comfortable. There's the obvious discomfort from the fact that there's literal blood dripping out of you. Most times when I'm on my period, it's accompanied by a strange cramping feeling, as if my gut was being torn apart from the inside. I also often get a headache. They occasionally feel feverish, like I'm going to pass out. Periods are incredibly hard to deal with. The first two times I got one, I stayed in my room all day trying to get the cramps to go away because it hurt too much to stand. Most menstruators learn to deal with the physical problems after a while, but the social problems are a little harder to figure out. For some reason in our culture, periods are seen as growth, like something to hide. At my school, I find myself doing everything I can to stop my peers from knowing around my period. It's super embarrassing to have your peers know such an intimate thing about you. Even unwrapping a pad in the bathroom is nerve-wracking. Going to the nurse is even scarier because not only your peers can find out, but you have to tell the nurse as well. I'm asking that period products are put in the bathroom so that students can easily access them without the embarrassment of going to the nurse. Thank you. My name is Alyssa Ranker. I'm a resident of East Hampton, and I'm a paraeducator 
I work at Amherst Regional High School. Um, I'm calling today to urge the school committee to agree to a solid cost of living adjustment to staff wages for the coming year and to strive for transparency and budget decisions for the coming year. The austerity of the current budget comes at a great cost to many beloved programs such as art, tech, family outreach, and staff positions. I am disappointed to see that the APEA's request for a 2% cost of living adjustment was rejected by the school committee, while Superintendent Morris has received a 4.3% rate. While I deeply respect Superintendent Morris' leadership, our district must value all set members' incredibly hard work this year when making budgetary decisions. Up to this point, there has been no concrete, specific commitment to a cost of living adjustment for staff. I and other members of the APEA support teachers and staff receiving a cost of living increase as close as possible to the 2% requested by the APEA. Many staff in this district, particularly our unit C staff like me, currently struggle to support ourselves and our families financially. The lack of a cost of living adjustment will affect all staff, but particularly our most vulnerable school employees, making it even more difficult to live in the midst of a global pandemic. All staff must be supported so our students and community can thrive. Thank you guys. Hello, my name is Carol Charrington. I live in Pelham. I have two grown children who went through the um, public schools in Pelham and Amherst, and I currently work as a paraeducator at Amherst High School. I'm calling to respectfully request the school committee to agree to a cost of living adjustment to staff wages for the coming year and to strive for transparency in budgetary decisions in this coming year. The austerity of the current budget comes at a great cost to many beloved programs, art, technology, family outreach, and staff positions. We are disappointed in the schools um, that the cost of living that the union requested, which was a 2% request cost of living adjustment, was rejected by the school committee, and yet we've seen um, sizable percentage increases for those in administration. Um, so up to the point, up to this point, there's been no concrete re reply from the school committee about what could be offered. And um, I and many other staff members and community members support educators receiving a decent cost of living increase as close to the 2% requested by the union. Um, okay, thank you very much for listening and uh, we look forward to hearing of your work. So uh, that concludes our public comment um, and uh, the names I believe are, will be included in our um, in our minutes. Um, before we go on to the next one, I want to apologize. I um, neglected to introduce um, one of our guests uh, this evening, Ms. Lauren Mills, who is joining us um, to uh, present part of the um, School Equity Task Force uh, report um, presentation. So welcome, Ms. Mills. Um, and now I will turn it over to Dr. Morris for the superintendent's update. Sure, I'll uh, start it and Ms. Cunningham will also uh, offer some updates as well. Um, and I know we're on a time crunch because there is an executive session later. So um, as I was trying to do, I'll try to be brief. Um, but the graduation survey for high school seniors and families will go out this week. Um, we're trying to, there, there is some fixed choices uh, that we have to make in terms of a number of students who can attend, a number of families who can attend, and um, like many other communities, we're going to have to make some challenging decisions. But the good news is we are, you know, one of our staff members was over at a potential site over at Look Park today, loved it, uh, had lots of good ideas, and um, we'll be engaging, again, all the students and, uh, and families um, in making the best decision as we move forward for an outdoor graduation for our seniors. Uh, I want to uh, second uh, what Ms. McDonald said and acknowledge and appreciate Ruby Kane for joining the committee. I also want to thank that Emily Gribko, who's done, a, in my opinion, an outstanding job uh, as a student rep for quite a while and 
Ms. McDonald and I had a, a good meeting to transition, uh, make that transition and support uh, Ruby with the transition. Ruby and I have known each other for quite some time uh, back at Crocker Farm, so I'm really happy to see uh, how much she's grown uh, and that she'll be part of this committee. So welcome, Ruby. Um, really happy to have you. Um, I uh, want to thank um, Mr. Sadiq, uh, the high school principal, uh, last Wednesday uh, hosted uh, a Google Meet for students who wanted to talk about the uh, hate crimes and acts of violence against the Asian Americans and Pacific Islander, the AAPI uh, population over the past year, uh, to work with students and faculty to ensure that um, the high school is responding uh, firmly and appropriately to what is being experienced by students here as well as people uh, across the country. So thank you, Mr. Sadiq, for that. This is, um, uh, I want to thank our staff. There's uh, a number of things going on for Autism Week, um, Acceptance Week this week. So today, and I was able to catch a couple of minutes of this, there was a college support discussion uh, where a number of colleges um, who have worked uh, successfully integrating students with disabilities into the higher educational uh, field, uh, met with students, and that was moderated by our staff. Tomorrow, there's an, a conversation about adult services as students who are transitioning out of our school district. And um, Thursday, there's a, a alumni and current student panel from the high school. Uh, Thursday afternoon from five to seven. Um, and some of it's, uh, again, a panel, and some of it's a discussion and celebration after the panel. Uh, so all are welcome, and that information's on our website. And, you know, kudos to all the staff members who are putting that on and families and students uh, who are going to sit on that. A um, couple other quick ones from me. Some good news um, that uh, in terms of the vaccination front, um, the town uh, of Amherst, as well as the town of Northampton, facilitated a second educators or school staff only a vaccination effort. And I think I mentioned the last time we met that um, I, I felt like most of our staff who wanted to be vaccinated had gotten vaccinated or had at least gotten a shot um, as we moved along. And this was confirmed. This uh, session in Amherst was for all towns east of uh, the Connecticut River in Hampshire County. There was 80 appointments. And when I checked uh, about an hour before starting last Saturday, 34 were unclaimed. Um, so to me, that means uh, that indicates that we're probably at a saturation point of staff members looking for vaccines, uh, being able to get them. And, and, you know, by all indications, the, the majority of our staff are interested in getting them. We don't, there's no data source for that. It's all anecdotal, but that's what I continue to hear. That being said, I want to thank the towns of Amherst and Northampton for providing that resource for our educators and our educators who are working together uh, along this front. Um, but it's certainly, uh, those. Are, just to be clear too, the uh, town really wanted me to emphasize this. It's not like those vaccines went away. They were integrated in the other um, appointments that are for non-educator or for anyone in, who's eligible that the town is doing. It's not like these are lost appointments. They just get integrated in and more people are able to get uh, vaccinated on their normal clinics. But it, it was a good data point to say that we are pretty close to saturation. Um, and, and that feels really good because, you know, I think that hopefully makes everyone feel a little more comfortable and confident. Um, got two more, just some data, initial data on return to in-person uh, at the high school. Our data shows about 60% of students are opting to return to in-person learning, and actually only about 20-25% are planning to use transportation or the buses, which helps us out, frankly, about the buses. Um, at the middle school, that number is a bit higher, um, so about 69% of students uh, are slated to return, uh, and about 50% of students are slated to take the bus. Um, I should have mentioned at the high school, we believe we can maintain a six foot distance in most, but not all classes. Uh, it sort of depends on, you know, individual classrooms and how many students were in the class and how many are showing up. But uh, we feel like we can get most of the way there. We do not believe we'll be at a three foot distance for any of our classes. It'll all be, you know, six or relatively close to six uh, feet. At the middle school, it looks like we'll be at five and a half feet of distancing. That's more evened out across the classes. Uh, weren't able to get, to get quite to six, but uh, five and a half again is, is ahead of the vast majority of districts in Massachusetts, uh, most of whom are at three feet of distancing. Summit Academy has 51% of students uh, returning. They have some students now in the voluntary return plan. I, went over, I was over there today. It was great to see some students um, 
some that Ruby and I know from Crocker Farm actually. So that was neat. Um, and um, since they were quite little and, uh, and so, and I was able to talk to some students and staff members. So they're, they're, they're going to be a shade over 50% uh, of their students. Again, smaller sample size because of Summit, but I wanted to update the committee and the community on that. And my last one I had is sharing a little bit about fall. We certainly may want to have this on an upcoming agenda at some point. Uh, and this was shared with the committee electronically, I believe this morning. Um, the state, uh, Mr. Sheen and I were on a webinar uh, from the state yesterday about uh, virtual schooling. Um, and it was for districts that showed some interest in maintaining some level of virtual education. I think the, um, the air was taken out a little bit of uh, Tim and I, you know, when we recognized that from the state's perspective, um, some things, frankly, aren't very realistic about maintaining that. Um, the application is much like becoming uh, almost creating a charter school in your district. It is creating a completely separate and autonomous school next year. Um, it would have to have a name. It would have to have a staffing model. It would have to have a nurse. It would have to have a food service delivery plan. Uh, all this is due, by the way, uh, for districts who are interested in, in the next about three and a half weeks. Uh, they talked about a ratio of 35 students to one instructor. So we're talking about radically different class size than what we um, experienced um, or we have implemented. Um, also, school choice students would not be eligible for the virtual school, even if they were existing in the district. Um, so there was some some what seemed to us to be some very uh, unusual rules around that. Um, I think implied, in my opinion, and Tim's opinion was that we already have two virtual schools in Massachusetts. There are schools of choice and that students who are interested may access those. But I will say the, the bar is extremely high and, and perhaps not attainable for moderate sized districts to cre fully create a school in the next month. It's due, actually it's due exactly a month from today. Uh, with a fully formed staffing model. Um, so the, the documents that accompanied that were emailed to the committee. Um, so it really has changed um, our perspective on perhaps what's possible uh, for the fall and, and perhaps at an upcoming meeting, we can go a little more in depth, but I did wanna uh, share that with the committee and the community that um, a more casual approach of maintaining some virtual options is uh, not going to be supported by our state um and and we had a, you know I, I don't want to sound like a broken record but we tim and i had a hard time thinking that school choice students would have no access to a virtual program because they are full members of the districts so there were there were numerous challenges that we had we had many other districts had on that call and i think you know when we do start talking i know in pelham we're going to have that conversation next week starting to talk about fall 2021 uh, and probably should do that at the region sometime soon as well but um i wanted to share that that was the update uh, that we had from Desi and the, uh, we sent some of the documentation, I think the slides um, also when we get them, I'll share with the committee. Before we transition to Ms. Cunningham's update, I wanted to pause and see if there's any questions for me. And Ms. Seeger. Yeah, in terms of um, the, thank you for the information on the high school and the middle school and the update on returning this spring. I was wondering if you could also if this isn't violating anything, talk about the school bus situation since it's part of the logistics. Sure. So uh, as uh, tomorrow at five o'clock is the deadline for the schools to make sure that they have accurate school um, bus and, you know, the transportation information to share with the transportation department. They then will be spending the next week and a half putting together routes. Um, and I think particularly for Shoots Fair and Leverett, I know there's some question about how that'll work. And once they get the accurate information, they'll be working on that. And I can share that back with the committee uh, I don't think we meet for a little while uh, after this meeting, but I can share that electronically so people are aware of uh, how that is going to shake out. Um, I see there's a follow up. Yeah, Miss Seeger. <laughs> yeah, my concern is with um, with the elementary school and the time change. So right. is that going to be part of what you'll share? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the short story is uh, the elementary school in Leverett and Shutesbury are going to start at the same time that they starting this week. Um, it's really about how do we get middle school and high school students? Are they going to share a bus and then just come down the hill or are there going to be a dedicated bus that comes earlier? And, and some of that just depends on the yield. Uh, I gave you the percentages, but the percentages don't mean anything. It really is the number of students in Shutesbury and Leverett uh, that are going to drive that decision. And until that's cold, which we'll have tomorrow, it's hard to make a determination. But absolutely, I, you know, I know that's a concern, and I'll be able to share that with the committee uh, likely before the break. Mr. Demling. Yeah, I have, I have three questions. Um, hopefully, the first two are very short. Um, so for the virtual schools, um, 
So th thank you for that. I, I also had read that Desi instruction, and it seemed, in addition to all the other complications that you mentioned, to be financially completely unfeasible for a district like ours in our budget situation. So even if we wanted to drop everything and and run run like the Dickens over the next three months and do all the things you talked about, I don't, it doesn't seem didn't seem to me like we had the the, the financial wherewithal. Um, so are, are we still going to have the ability to though to uh, do something for our, our our small number of students that may have a severe medical situation, um, yeah. where um, if COVID isn't completely wrapped up, which probably won't be 100% wrapped up by the time we go back in the fall, um, that if we you know if we have children two students that are immunocompromised and whatnot, you know what what are our ways to accommodate them? And then I'll throw you a second completely unrelated topic if you want to answer it at the same time. Uh, can you just talk about the MCAS update and its its impact, particularly for um, uh, our seniors next year? Yep, so on the first one, they did talk about students uh, who are auto-immunocompromised and um, they did not frame it like this, I think because of legal reasons, but the sense I got is um, that we would treat them like other students who can't attend school because of health reasons. Um, we have home health aid and home health programs that we provide now for students for a variety of reasons who can't attend school. Um, and I think what I heard, what was implied in the comments and Tim heard the same thing was that uh, we would use the same kind of model that we have now with home-based tutoring uh, and access to courses that way. Um, so they said an FAQ document would clarify that. That FAQ document has not been released, but when it is, I'll be sure to share it with the committee and come back to share that uh, update with the community. Um, the second one is that MCAS are no longer a graduation requirement for the class of 2022. Um, so given the interruptions and given where they are in their education, the state is no longer requiring uh, passing the MCAS to receive a diploma for that class. Any other questions, Mr. Dunley? Um, yeah, I'm happy to come back around. Um, so uh, since grade to the middle school, so I understand that this is a massively busy month for you and the rest of the district with regards to all of the dates for in-person return. Um, and, and I believe we have uh, talking about sixth grade to the middle school at this committee's level. Uh, on May 4th. Um, are we going to be, so the question I have for you, Dr. Morris, are we going to be ready to hit the ground running with that process so that we can really uh, engage, uh, do a high engagement, um, time efficient process? The, re the reason I ask is that I ideally it would be good to be a for our districts that may, may decide to send if, if, if the regional committee agrees um, to send six to the middle school for them to also have time to make the decision. I'm thinking of other committees that I said, another committee I sit on and there's three other towns as well. Um, it would be good for those districts to be able to make that decision by the end of this school year. And if we start this process in earnest on May 4th, that really leaves us a couple months before the, the school year ends. And so I'm, I'm just wondering if in terms of timeline, do you, do you, as of this date, do you think that, that if that's still realistic to achieve? Uh, I'll be quick on my answer. No, I don't think it's realistic to achieve. I think the, the, the community's capacity to engage in a question of that magnitude as students are returning to school, separate from our like, central office, that's not where I'm going with my comments, but um, you know, that's the date at which you know, our middle school, high school students are returning when we'd be starting that engagement. Um, I, I'm hard pressed to, to think that that could um, occur under that timeline without feeling incredibly rushed. I know we had a school start time change uh, that occurred under a pretty quick timeline, but that wasn't a six, you know, a four week timeline. Um, and I think this change, the magnitude of it is quite a bit better and just uh, bigger. And some of it's just logistics and legally, you know, how that change would occur given the different districts. If we were one K to 12 district, I might say, yeah, we can, we can do that engagement. I think the reality is uh, some of the details that are going to be highly relevant on financial and illegal ground um, are going to likely take longer, even if we started today. Um, to fully resolve where uh, I think the committee can be ready. And that, that's relying on folks like legal counsel and you know the Mass Association of Regional Schools and, and how that all shakes out, uh, as well as the towns, um, all four towns. Um, so uh, I think, can we absolutely start the engagement this spring? Absolutely. I, I, I have a hard time thinking that towns will be ready to make a decision um, in the middle of, I'm thinking of the other towns too, they're, they're in, there's, Springtown meeting that's happening. A lot of energy will go to budgets and Springtown meetings. They start up on May 1st, but then they go on and Shootsbury's not, I think, till June or 12th, something like that. I think, um, thank you. 
and then uh, Pelham and Leverett are towards the beginning of May. So uh, I think in bandwidth, I think the goal, my personal goal, I know this is going to be on our upcoming agenda, is how do we build our capacity to talk about it? How do we acculturate the community to think about it? I know we did some of that last year, but that was pre-COVID. And uh, I don't think picking up right where we left off is going to be where uh, is going to be people's mindset. So um, what I'd like to do at the next meeting, which I know we're getting creeping into agenda planning, and Ms. McDonald can stop me if, if <laughs> she thinks it's wise, uh, maybe we'll talk about it during agenda planning, because I think we should have a conversation of what, what, what our expectations are for that agenda item and how to move forward. But I think that'd probably be the more appropriate place for that discussion. I agree. Ms. King. Do you have any insight on MCAS for class of 2023? Nope, they, uh, well, yeah, that's not true. Yes, I do. Uh, at this point, the uh, state has only relaxed the rules, so to speak, for the class of 2022. I think the expectation for class of 23 will probably be unchanged from the expectations for classes that have come before it and will come after it. That's my that's my understanding, and and they they continue to say to be determined, or we'll share more information. So as I get more, I'll be able to share that. But um, at this point, all I know about is uh, all I've been told about is twenty twenty two. There is an alternate path for twenty twenty one, like we did last year, of competency determination, and uh, that did help a couple of students graduate who who needed some support last spring, and we're you know we're looking if there's any students who need that for this spring as well. Any other questions for Dr. Morris? Not seeing any. I'll turn it back to you. Sure, I'll turn it over to Ms. Cunningham. Hello, everyone. Uh, typically in November, our HR department has an opportunity or, or for many years have had an opportunity to report on some of the diversity equity work that's taking place in the district. And you know, this past November, we were not able to due to the pandemic and many of the other things that took precedence. So I'm just going to briefly follow Dr. Morris's lead to try to run through some of the things that we have been doing this year. And I will read from the document really quickly. So remember, tip, I normally have a large PowerPoint. We normally take about 25 minutes, but I'm going to just run through this as quickly as possible. So as far as staffing, the information on our DESI, uh, which is the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education website, is still unchanged. So the data that we presented uh, last year remains. And that data just shows that we're doing a really good job at slowly increasing our number of staff who identify as a person of color in the region. And we are also doing a better job at retaining our staff at the region. So many of our curriculum has been reviewed and some modifications have been made and uh, we're still at the secondary level, still working on making changes to the curriculum to make it more uh, diverse and helping our students to have access to different curriculum that has pictures and um, tells the real history is what we're looking to do and will continue to do at that level. Many of our staff members have attended Joe Truss and he is the founder of the Dismantling White Supremacist Culture Program. So approximately 130 of our staff have attended and this is 130 individuals across all of our bargaining units. We've also had Goldie Muhammad, Dr. Bettina Love and Kimmy Carlos speak to our staff and present on topics such as race, racism, abolitionist thinking, and youth and the trauma of racism. Goldie Muhammad continues to work with the high school and um, she's there to help them with the professional development that they're doing on creating action plans to move the high school forward on these topics. Kimmy Carlos, who I mentioned was one of our keynote speakers, she is also going to come back and speak to families and caregivers of youths so that she can talk about the intersectionality of trauma and race. And that'll be upcoming either the end of April or sometime early May. We usually have a fall professional development half day. And this year I'm pleased to announce that we were able to offer two of these days. So we had one in the fall and we recently had one last month. 
Um, many of our teachers led the fall professional development opportunities. This uh, March, many of our um, teachers just facilitated a conversation among content areas. And this is the first time in a long time that they were able to stay either at grade level cohorts or content area cohorts, meaning all math teachers joined together, all English teachers, all related service workers joined together. So across the vertical alignment, they were able to just have conversations and find out what each person is doing in regards to racism and reviewing their own bias. Along with the items listed above, some of the schools have had book groups and community readings and have read books such as This Book is Anti-Racist by Tiffany Jewell. Some have also read How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram Kendi. And many schools are currently reviewing their policies and practices that disproportionately identifies one group of students for services. And the middle school has developed a partnership with an organization called PK, which is Parent Institute for Quality Education. And just going from their website, it's a national organization that engage, empower, and transform parents to actively engage in their, parent, in their child's education and strengthen parent-school collaboration. So how do we know it's working? We use the typical evaluation system, whether it's quantitative or qualitative information. We get this directly from staff via surveys, via exit interviews, and also the decrease in the number of investigations that HR has had to do. So that's my brief update, and I am open to any questions that the committee may have. Thank you. That was uh, impressive, <laughs> so condensing that into the, that list and, um, and also um, accomplishing all of that during, um, during this pandemic year. So, um, questions? Ms. Dancer. Uh, thank you, Ms. Cunningham. That was very nice to hear all of those things. I'm wondering, is, do you have a document that you could actually share with us that has this information in it? I do have the document that I just wrote with my notes on it, but um, I can always put something together and share it with the school committee. That would be, I thank you, would be appreciated. Mm -hmm. Mr. Demling? Um, yeah, thank you. That was a, a very uh, comprehensive, impressive list. Um, a couple of questions. Um, uh, a, a year or so ago, um, we, we talked about uh, that we, we had introduced anti-bias training into our um, hiring process in terms of people that participate on screening committees and interview committees. I'm just wondering, if, if is that something that we're still doing and, and how is that going? Is it Has that been well received? And do, do, you, do you feel like now that we've had a bit of time with it working, do you feel like that's improved the process? Uh, and then my second question, I forgot, so I'll just stick with the first one. <laughs> oh, thank you for asking that question. Yes, we did in introduce the anti-racism part in our hiring process. And I'll tell you that it has worked tremendously because one, we have increased the number of people being hired who are people of color. And, um, and it's not as though we targeted people of color to say, oh, we're gonna make sure to do X, Y, and Z with them. We still have the screening process where there are no names and of course there's no uh, race listed. And when we do things the way the uh, committee had found to be best practice, we found that people of color have been moved to the interview round, which they typically were not, right? So now they're getting that chance to interview. And um, recently, as recently as yesterday, I had someone mention to me that the way our process is has been so helpful to them because they this is a candidate who came in for an interview she said typically she's anxious coming into a room full of people but the way we communicate our process and the way we give them a step-by-step -step guidance as to what's going to take place when they're interviewing and then being able to come into the room virtually um, and seeing all these different faces she felt comfortable because it wasn't just one race, or the typical race that she was seeing at the table. And she felt that her voice was heard and respected during the interview. I had another gentleman who came in for an interview today and he said, you know, he wished other places 
would revamp their hiring process to be similar to ours because our process shows our commitment to social justice and equity. Ms. Kane. Um, so I know that you mentioned stuff about the secondary curriculum being revised. Can you go, can you dive deeper into um, what class areas are being revised and if that would possibly mean more classes or different class frameworks? So I can only go into that very briefly because I am not the principals at the secondary level. So I can only tell you that based on the information I received, I know they're looking at the math curriculum and um, social studies, English, and other content areas. And what changes will be made was, would be made based on teacher input after the group reviews all the curriculum. And the principal, of course, would, or each principal would, of course, talk to the staff, students, and communicate with families about any changes that are being made. Any other questions for Ms. Cunningham? Mr. Demling. So um, that was really helpful on the anti-bias training uh, on the on the um, the recruitment piece. And the, you know, we also talked about retention. So it was good to hear that you know our retention is also increasing. That's and a lot of companies struggle with that because there's so much focus on the interview process and widening the pool that, that once employees get here. And I know we had talked a little bit again a, a little while back about uh, affinity groups and staff of color and, and new staff and how how we, we support um, staff, especially in their first years to acclimate and, and whatnot. Is, is that something that we're still doing? And, and can you talk about that a little bit? We do have um, affinity groups still in, in um, Amherst. And I know this year it was a struggle to continually meet as an affinity group. We also have a small group of individuals who are looking to create a mentoring program for staff who identify as persons of color or BIPOC so that in their first and possibly second year of being here in Amherst, they have a, staff, a dedicated staff member who looks like them and can understand their experiences to help guide them through the process of being here in Amherst and help them through uh, navigating some of the things that they may not have navigated in other districts. So that's something that we're looking at. There's also groups of individuals who um, would call themselves white allies to help to work on the culture in the district um, on a, from a different lens of, of individuals. So yes, affinity. So the short answer is yes, affinity groups are still in existence, but um, we're changing the face of what these affinity groups may look like. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any. So um, thank you very much for that update. Super helpful. Um, now we'll move on to um, chair's update. And I, I think the only update that I'll share um, is that uh, yesterday evening, Ms. Stancer and I joined Dr. Morris and Dr. Slaughter at the Amherst Town Council meet, meeting of the Town Council last night um, to present the regional school budget that we approved two weeks ago. Um, and, uh, and it was a budget hearing as well. So um, lots, of, lots of good discussion and comment um, I think the, the, to sum up sort of the primary, well, and there was a finance committee meeting on further on that today. So, um, uh, I would say, um, biggest question areas were just understanding how we define, um, level services budget, um, and how that shows up in our budget documents. Um, and I'm trying to, I didn't write down the other one right now, but, um, Ms. Stancer, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. No, I guess just that, um, I guess the number of public comments that were concerned about the cut of the art position at the middle school and actually just um, people saying, you know, this is not the time to be cutting education. Thank you. Yeah, there was robust public comment um, also during the hearing. So. 
Uh, moving on to our next item, the school committee announcements. Does anybody um, from the committee have any announcement or updates they'd like to share? Seeing none. Um, and we're, we, we made up a lot of our lost time, so that's great. Um, so we'll move on now to our new and continuing business. And our one main item this evening is the presentation from the School Equity Task Force. And um, as I introduced earlier, um, Ms. Lauren Mills is joining us this evening to participate in that. And I'm not sure, do I turn it over to Ms. Lord or Ms. Mills? I'm gonna begin, she's gonna end. Okay, and I will share my screen so that you all can see the... Thank you, and well, Chair McDonald gets the slides up. I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you, Chair McDonald, for welcoming this presentation. And thank you, of course, to our SETF School Equity Task Force um, members who worked really hard this whole year trying to be supportive, gather information, get it to the school committee and district, and just be helpful wherever we could. Um, in some ways, we're like, why are we presenting this now? Because it's fixed. We're all going back to school, but no. Um, part of what has been highlighted, spotlit, just drawn more to the surface is some of the inequities that are existing in all our institutions in this country. And so I want us to like have this on our public record and in our minds that we can go back and say, okay, this is something and we're working on it. And um, Assistant Superintendent Cunningham just so showed a really solid way that Amherst is taking, Amherst Pelham Regional School District is taking huge or steps forward in this work. So it's not just performative or like on paper, we're actually doing stuff. So this is just a piece of that, our piece of that. Um, School Equity Task Force survey on experiences during and impacts of remote learning. Next slide, please. An overview of the SETF. Oh, okay, SETF. We only had 62 families that participated um, in this, not, I shouldn't say only, but 39% were people of color identified and 21% were not people of color identified, but on free or reduced lunch. So some of the 39% of the POC is also on free or reduced lunch. Next slide, please. What worked well? This pandemic has taught us a lot. It's been a lot of hard lessons, but there's also been some things that, oh, I really want to keep that post pandemic. Um, so some feedback we got was the later start time. We've remedied that for our up secondary students. Three classes instead of seven. That's not sustainable, but we might want to look at what are ways we can de-densify some of that in the future. Being home with family, less distraction. The book bags, thank you to the librarians. I wanna lift Susan Wells up because she was the first one I learned to do it and there's probably all of our librarians. So please don't be offended if I don't sell your names, but thank you to the librarians and volunteers who did that. Small groups, breakout rooms, and then yeah, teachers and paraprofessionals have been great and patient, but we knew that already. Next slide, please, hopefully. So mental health, um, CPAC also did a survey and, and this is sort of similar to theirs. Uh, of course, eight to 10 reported negative effects on household mental health. There's no surprise there. Um, next slide, please. There was a, a desire and a need for more tutoring um, and it was a pandemic and we we're all doing the best we can, but maybe this is something even going forward that we need to look at, like how do we get tutor services or make them more accessible if you don't have an IEP or a 504, or even if you do. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. And then, of course, there was more, we were more likely to experience fin negative financial impacts if we were already on free and reduced lunch because many of our families, me included, are in that where we can't work from home. Our jobs aren't such, my two jobs still haven't opened up. Um, not to be about me, but I'm just saying the financial impact on our families. And then I'm blessed because I can get a stimulus check, but there's a lot of our families that can't get that for whatever reason. So um, I know it's not the schools. Yeah, we think about the whole child. So we also want to think about what they're going through. Sorry about all these dings. I just got some good news. Um, next slide, please. I'll turn my phone off. Maybe that'll help. Communication with the school. This is something that I know everybody has been doing their best with. Um, but a lot of in retrospect and moving forward, how do we communicate with families differently? Um, 
this is a handful that were not contacted. And maybe it's the squeaky wheel, but sometimes the squeaky wheel doesn't know how to reach out. And so communication, there'll be another slide, so I'm not going to take up too much time. Um, next slide, please. Oh, here it goes. That is the other slide. I guess I'm doing it. <laughs> is this number 10? No, this is the last one, I think. Okay. Communication is one definite way to break the isolation of the pandemic. I do know that we had a survey recently and a lot of families hadn't responded. So the guidance counselors or the high school staff called every family that hadn't responded. And then they followed up with a second call. So I know right now, presently, our communication is really chugging, chugging. Um, but how can we do it besides just email and surveys? And so that's, we want to look at that, think about that. How do we get more out there to the neighborhoods that, you know, might need us to be there. And then there is no one site to go to or general number to call for information. And our website has a lot of information, but it is still tricky. You need to know to go where to go to look for the information. So that's just food for thought. And thank you very much. Next slide, please. And I believe I'm handing it over to you, Ms. Mills. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me this evening um, and allow me to speak um, uh, as a member of the SETF, the School Equity Task Force, and I'm also a parent, so I'm speaking as a parent as well. Um, I We did this survey, I believe it was in the beginning of January, and um, as Heather said, and as you know, many in the district were concerned about um, what the effects of um, the so remote learning we're having. Um, I am not a, like a doctor or a psychologist or anything like that. So from what I observed in my own children and what I know all of us have heard from the responses from other parents that, you know, called in and left voice messages and attended other school, um, school, school committee meetings have been very like distressing, distressing as well to hear, you know, what they were going through. Um, and also I know that, you know, members of the school committee have made the comment that, you know, the, the stress of um, dealing with this new normal of, you know, not being able to see um, friends, not being able to be um, in the school with your teachers, even though that's not the case now, um, that still, you know, may and is most likely going to have an impact um, on students. Um, not just, you know, it's not just going to end once, you know, schools open up fully. Um, so these were some of the questions that uh, the School Equity Task Force came up with um, that you know, I guess are for all of us to consider and take take in. Um, how will this commitment to social justice and an anti-racist curriculum be accomplished? Um, I'm sorry, I should have started with the top. ARPS has committed to a system that is des dedicated to social justice and multiculturalism uh, as part of their mission, mission statement, but we know uh, on the, um, in the same breath or in, in the same um, schools district that we do have challenges around um, bias, around um, equity and disparity in our school system. So um, that was one of the questions. Um, individual families have sought tutoring, mental health counseling, social contact and contact the schools about their needs, um, uh, but not necessarily from our, um, our only survey, there wasn't a, a big response back from uh, the schools. And, you know, I'm one of the parents who, you know, I, I like to, you know, know what's going on, but as Heather mentioned from the, the, the findings of the survey, um, a lot of parents, you know, they're, they're busy or they're just maybe not, they don't know where to, to look or, or to call um, and so maybe they're not getting the information that they need to like, you know, advocate or be supportive of, of their, their child as, as well as they would want to. Um, can, can, how can the district retain uh, staff of color and build on these programs? Um, 
I'm just going to read all of them. What data will demonstrate that the district has effectively addressed these issues? How will the district communicate uh, these programs and provide ongoing communication to families in need? And I think, yeah, that's a big thing, communication, because there may be things that the school district is doing um, that parents don't don't know about or and and we're just you know forming our opinions are um from you know what we what we don't see happening because we don't know what the the school district is doing so the presentation from um Doreen cunningham uh, it would be nice if you know the setf had a better communication to know all the things that you know the school district and um amherst uh schools are, are doing, administration is doing. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I got this, uh, this next information from um, a, a website. Um, it's called uh, Berlia and um, it is like, it, if you want further information, you can go to the website. Um, but uh, it says the effects that so the, the, the effects that sole remote learning likely has likely has already had on Amherst students. I'm just going to read the quote um, from the website. Not only does screen time take away from our personal and quality time, studies show it increases anxiety and restlessness. Studies show that too much screen time can make children exhibit symptoms of ADHD. Limiting, limiting screen time and taking control of content on screen helps you discover more of the amazing non-tech driven world around us. It's a calmer space to live in. Um, and then it has um, three articles um, of how video games affect your child's development, uh, parental control tricks to monitoring screen time for kids, screen time and kids with attention issues, what you need to know. And um, before the whole remote learning, we always had the message, you know, from doctors and um, that, you know, too much screen time, you know, you have to monitor it. And then now our children were on the screens for school, like six hours a day or, or so. And then plus that, because they had the ability to use a computer, they would use it even after school ended. So I think that, you know, that really has had an impact on, you know, our children and our students. Next slide, please. Um, this is a um, some information that I got from the ARPS website around uh, restorative, just, uh, restorative practice resources. Um, and I wasn't sure if people could see the the left where um, the left rounded, you know, um, image that has restorative practice in the um, the center. So I was just going to read that. And um, it says restorative practices. Um, um, again, this is a, a guide for educators. Um, uh, it's an article. Well, it's a, a it's information from 2014. That's on the ARPS website, and it says because at the SETF we've you know struggled with you know is does the school um, what restorative practices do they have in place you know. Is their mis mission, does it expand to anti-racism um, work for, you know, school-wide administrators and staff and all that? Or is it just like for a social awareness? Is it multiculturalism? So there's like all these terms and we weren't really sure, you know, exactly what the schools, what, what the school is implementing. Um, but um, restorative practices should include um, a, to um, address and, and discuss the needs of the school community. Build healthy relationships between educators and students. Resolve conflict, hold individuals and groups accountable. Repair harm and restore positive relationships and reduce, prevent and improve harmful behavior. Um, the the right-hand side, um, Hope I'm saying that right. Is another um, visual from the web um, from the uh, restorative practice uh, resources on ARPS website. Um, it says a tale of two schools, um, and one side talks about um, or shows like the 
progression of like if you have a zero tolerance tolerance education system, how that affects students, and then the difference between that and and restorative practices uh, in an educational system, and how it restorative practices, you know, are have a better outcome for students, and I think for the whole school. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, this is just some more um, information that um, I got from the website, um, the arts website. And again, books are a great, a great way uh, for um, parents to, you know, get their children curious about other cultures, other people. Um, so um, I think this, you know, is, is a a good list, even though I'm not sure when this was put together. Um, I think it was, it says 2006. And as also was mentioned before that um, there have been other book clubs or book um, discussions around um, social justice and um, racial justice. And I just want to um, commend and, and thank um, the Crocker Farm PGO for supporting um, a racial identities book club that I think we've gone through four books and we're going to a to a fifth book so that that has been a, a good experience to connect with um, parents and be supported by the PGO. Next slide please. Um, yeah I, I do want to reiterate that I really I really feel like um, there has to be, there is a need, and so there has to be a strong demand um, from the community. And as a, a member of SCTF, again, uh, we are, you know, trying to be be that voice and advocate for the needs that we see the community um, is having. So um, we really need um, a budget from the school committee that supports restorative practices, that develops the love of learning and affinity um, for others, says to others, but for others, counseling and tutoring for any student who requ requests it based on the school-wide effects of COVID and loss of in-person learning. And I'm just gonna stop there because um, as it is now, um, it feels like unless, you know, you're individually um, advocating for your child, that's one thing. Or if your child has a special needs, that's another thing. But again, the COVID um, pandemic, the effects of COVID on, on the all students, um, whether it's small or great, um, needs to be addressed and it needs to be, um, it needs to be seen that it's 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 an issue so i would hope that the school committee can provide counseling and tutoring for all students um, who request it um, and we have suggested using the family center to expand um, uh, this work and and so we would like to use the family center as a place to practice restorative justice and provide resources to families and staff so that students feel comfortable, heard, acknowledged in their lived experiences and are able to speak for themselves and speak up for others. Continued use of technology to, to close educational disparities and address each student and their individual learning styles and needs. Next slide, please. Um, Anti-racist curriculum. Um, Again, there's a lot of terms, so I had to look this up again, and I'm just going to um, read a definition that I got from um, a website called um, uh, the Committee for, for Children. Again, there's, there's many, um, there's many um, I guess you could say doctors or um, leaders in, in, or consultants that can speak, you know, more to these these things than just you know a parent, um, but I wanted to just share a definition of anti-racist uh, curriculum. It it says from this website it says addresses um, power dynamics and equity 
and anti-racist curriculum addresses power dynamics and equity, brings awareness to prejudice while promoting respect for and value of differences, falls under social justice, um, education, which centers around development of social awareness of inequities along with, with a critical lens that encourages social action. And I think that's what We want to be. Um, we want to see a a active participation in in this work. Next slide, please. Um, this is the last slide, and um, I, I it might seem a little off, but <laughs> um, I think you know besides the work um, that. Uh, uh, Ms. Cunningham shared that the district is doing. Um, we often get like when these external um, things happen like the pandemic or, uh, you know, uh, violence that has, you know, happened, you know, in different parts of, you know, the, the country that affect, you know, us and, and and bring these these issues to the the forefront um, racial race racism and um, and and violence um, we we need to uh, not just like send out a letter um, saying that we condemn it but um, I think again it's what what are the other action steps that we can take and I you know just in my research I um, came across this um, and it, it shows 19, um, 19 towns, um, I believe in Massachusetts that have declared um, racism a public health crisis. Um, I'm not sure if Northampton is on here, but I think Northampton is one town that's very nearby that has declared racism a public health crisis and maybe that's something as a school committee and as a um, school community, we can um, think about doing. And yeah, that's the end of my, my part. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, pretty comprehensive. Do, um, does anybody have any questions for Ms. Mills or Ms. Lord? Um, and I'll also note that uh, Mr. Harrington is also um, one of our um, committee reps on the SETA. Any questions or comments? Mr. Demling. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the, the focus on the theme of, of communication, the need for proactive communication and, and how that relates to the mental health um, needs of students as we return from COVID. Um, I feel like, you know, one of the ways in which systemic racism manifests is that, like the, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? And so if you, if you know how to if you know how to work the system, if you know how to communicate, if if you have the language, if you have the tools, um, that you can you can get the services you need, um, and and if you don't, then then you can you have additional barriers. And so um, I think one of the slides mentioned the website, um, and uh, I would I would second that that you know there are there are some Sometimes there are services that are available, uh, whether that's um, you know uh, support for families through the family center, or whether that's academic support um, or, or mental health support, and it's it's not easily discoverable, right? And so there's it's one thing to have these things available; it's another thing to be easily discoverable. So actually, Dr. Morris, I, I I don't know if if you've done some thinking already, and I know we've talked a lot at the school committee about we know there's going to be increase in mental health needs. Um, as students come back, especially next next fall, and as people really settle in, um, and you know, I, I I'm sure that if students are or families are loud or proactive about their need, or you know, are of their own accord are coming to tell staff um, of their mental health needs, that they'll be addressed. Um, but the, but then there's all the students and families who who aren't going to feel that comfortable, right? And so what? Given this, not this is going to be another abnormal year, right? pandemic recovery, you know, what, what's, our, what's our early thinking on how do we proactively reach out to 
uh, and monitor, uh, you know, students so that um, we're proactively ad addressing their mental health needs, right? Because we don't want to have like half the school year go by and then have kids really struggling and then only then intervene in the crisis. Um, and obviously these things affect, um, you know, disadvantaged students, you know, more so. So um, I don't know if you have initial thoughts on that. Yeah, I'll share just two quick ones. One is that it's certainly something that we're planning on doing uh, over the summer. I think it's going to be hard to survey students or to come to conclusions until they're in our, until many of them are in our buildings. And I think we'll have a much, we're even two days in at the elementary level, we're getting a sense of where uh, students are, not just in what their, you know, surveys would say, but what they're literally telling us. So uh, I think we're going to have a great opportunity to understand where students are from the last two months of the school year at the middle school and high school level. I think the second piece is, is then utilizing the summer to do some action planning. Uh, it might involve some surveying or focus groups of students, and we are looking to utilize some of our stimulus funds in a way to support uh, the well-being of students in, in all the ways that you mentioned. Uh, I think Ms. Mills' presentation was spot on in terms of highlighting that as a major need as we head to the next school year and that this pandemic, and we've talked about this multiple times, has been experienced. It's one pandemic and everyone's experienced it in their own unique way uh, and uh, not equally across the board, as you noted. So, you know, we are going to take a keen look on what students experience as they're in the building. We know that's not all students, but it is going to be a good snapshot for us. And then to do some really action planning over the summer uh, with the stimulus dollars that we have to figure out what supports, additional supports do we need and how to make sure that families are aware and can access those. Um, I just wanted to add, I had made a note um, during the budget hearing last night with the town council that um, one of the council members asked how they can help, what, what we can do to help them communicate how we're going to be ready to help the students with, you know, and, and advocate, not advocate, but Communic for them to be able to tell people what the schools are doing to be prepared for the issues that are going to come up when students come back to school. So I, um, that stood out for me last night. I, I have a, a quick question. Um, maybe it's not quick, but um, I recall, sort of, um, maybe it was at the end of last school year, that um, SCTF was looking exactly, trying to dig into that a little bit more on communication and outreach directly to families. Um, and I was wondering sort of if there, if you've had further conversations about that and sort of ideas about other ways um, that the that the district or the school committee. Um, can be connecting with with um, the families that you're, you're that you're talking to. I guess that's a question for our SCTF reps or Ms. Mills. I'm sorry, I didn't know if you were. Sorry, I apologize. <laughs> addressing that to us. Can you say it again? Um, my question for the for our SC for either of the three of you from SCTF is. is I, I recall that the conversations were beginning probably last summer um, about sort of how how to ways to engage and, and, and conduct outreach to the communities, um, particularly communities of color within within our district. And I just wondered if you if you had insight or thoughts or sort of you know um, more deeper than what we, we were talking about then that you would be helpful for the district or the school committee to, to sort of work on in terms of outreach. My first response would be um, anybody who's listening who has ideas, please. Oh, I didn't wait for you to call on me, Chair McDonald. I'm sorry. You don't have to. I, I was directing my question at <laughs> one of you three. So. Thank you. <laughs> Is to please. Um, email, call it in, any ideas that we're not going to think of because more heads is better than like 100 heads is better than three. Um, but I know that the pandemic's really squished it a lot. No excuses, but I, I'm hoping to be out in the apartment complexes weekly on some rotating schedule, just sitting there with a chair and some water 
and be accessible that way. I also think when we have community events again, especially ones like Kwanzaa, Juneteenth, maybe having a table set up just with information about who we are, how we can just like the face-to-face -face building relationships. Those are my two ideas. I know other people have ideas, but we would also welcome any ideas from the community because we're all the, the district. Yeah, thank you. I would just add quickly, um, every week we get a newsletter from the superintendent. And um, so I get information from there, uh, but I don't think all um, all parents, you know, they may not, they might not check their email, or they may not look for information, you know, in that way. So I had suggested um, SCTF, um, a newsletter um, that could share other you know community information and other important events um that could just be that would actually be printed and put into people's hands or you know you know be able to be distributed to their door i'm um, just like a one page newsletter that would be helpful i see two questions i don't know who was first so i'll start with ms king uh, I have a question angled towards Dr. Morris. Um, you're discussing a lot about the summer, but I'm kind of curious. From this data, we see that eight out of 10 um, people are experiencing mental health crisis or having mental health issues. What are you doing now currently and specifically in the high school around that? Sure, so I wanna compliment our mental health folks at our high school uh, and, and you're right for noting that I should have mentioned this earlier, um, who have been doing tremendous work doing uh, office hours, uh, proactive work, our folks in the Bright program who are uh, are working with a broad range of students right now and adjustment counselors and psychologists who are trying to keep tabs on students that they can't see in person, which is which is a unique challenge. Um, so in my opinion, you know, uh, they've really risen to the challenge to try to meet students' needs where they are um, and have done proactive outreach for high school students. Um, the communication, again, for families has been really critical. Uh, you know, sometimes it's thought of more of the K-8 piece, but I think in the, particularly as it relates to a pandemic, that family communication at the high school has also been critical uh, in maintaining those connections for students. And so it's not something we often talk about because it's not something that I'm sort of at liberty to disclose in terms of some of the interventions that have gone on for individual students. But I do think the committee and the community should be aware that at the high school level, uh, our counseling team has been working uh, in, in all sorts of ways, and that's including Summit Academy as well, uh, to meet student needs um, and to uh, best support students uh, all along the way. Um, and they've really taken the lead on that, um, you know, even going back to last spring uh, when things were much less organized um, to be able to do that. So, you know, that that's really the framing that we've had is supporting the work. We've also done some work. Um, Dr. Brady uh, facilitated a group of the leaders, um, you know, thinking about homework, thinking about how we support students uh, in great acquisition and, and, and those some of those challenges to acknowledge that they're going on for students and how do we kind of share some grave forgiveness uh, during this difficult time, which has been critical for students and their well-being as well. Um, I think the last thing I'll say is um, one of the largest things that we've also done is maintaining a later start time, which all the evidence um, suggests both uh, nationally um, as well as in Massachusetts is one of the greatest contributors to improving students' mental health is not forcing them to be at school at 7.30 in the morning. Um, and I know it sounds simplistic, and the evidence is very convincing that that's going to, will continue to contribute uh, this year, and then will be implemented more fully next year uh, as a strategy to support well-being of students. Did you have a follow-up, Ms. King, or is it a separate question? I did. Um, I should have reiterated, what have you added on that, like what has been, additional that you didn't do last year to support um, more students with mental health issues? Sure. So um, I think a couple of things. Um, one is I think, you know, we certainly, if this is a topic that the committee wants to have, we can have the mental health team from the high school come because I think they could describe uh, what they've done in a drastically better way than I can summarize. So I don't want to be disrespectful to their work. Um, but I think as, as it relates to the difference between last spring and this fall and throughout this year, just we've been much more organized about keeping tabs on students, uh, making sure that uh, there's more regular communication, even the kind of how you sign up for an appointment with a counselor, like, you know, some of the electronic systems have been developed uh, in much more thorough ways than 
last spring when we were kind of in reactive mode as instead of a uh, much more proactive approach this year. Also, the, just in general, the teachers have been, you know, had more time to prepare for what was happening. And a lot of the PD we had this summer about distance learning wasn't really just focused on the uh, more academic side. It was about how to support student well-being and making sure students weren't on screens or didn't feel like they had to be screens on every single second of every single day to accomplish their learning. Uh, what are different ways at the high school level that students could still be activated uh, and learning without being glued to a screen uh, from 9 to 2.30. And so those are some of the ways, but certainly if it's a topic we want, I'm um, sure we could have folks come in and, and share more specific details on that. Ms. Spitzer. Um, first, I just want to thank Ms. Mills, Ms. Ms. Lord, and Mr. Harrington for all the hard work on SATF over this presentation happened once a year, but I know you guys are serving for the entire year, so thank you very much. Um, the, the I'm happy to hear that we're going to potentially be using federal dollars to help uh, meet the needs for counseling and tutoring. And I think everybody's said that already. So thank you. Um, I'm happy to hear that. I guess my question has been, um, and maybe this is something more agenda planning, so I, will, I won't go too far into it, but I just wanted to understand if the survey that we do annually of students to kind of ask about the environment and how things have, because we've had this nice longitudinal data set that we've created and now we have the pandemic. Um, I'm curious if that's still happening and if there's any potential to potentially um, ask about some of these mental health needs or other count, you know, types of needs that might be unique to the pandemic could be introduced through that uh, mechanism that we have annually. Um, so, we, yep. so we did not survey students in um, and partially because of the pandemic, um, but we did, uh, I did get a report from the mental health uh, team at the middle school, high school was discussed about whether we should um, survey folks or not, and they opted for not. Um, and again, if, if this is something that the committee would like, um, certainly could have them back and describe their thinking and their report and what they're seeing from students from a well-being perspective, challenges they're seeing and interventions they're doing uh, in much more detail. Um, given that this was an SETF presentation, I wasn't respectfully prepared to talk in the level of detail that are, I'm being asked to, but if that's a topic the committee would like, we certainly can ask the expert to come back uh, and be able to do that. We'll, we'll come back to that in our agenda planning. Ms. Mills, did you have a, 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 a comment that you wanted yeah. to add? Yeah, yeah I um, just wanted to say that um, it sounds like the counseling services are I'm not sure, but it sounds like they're one-on-one -on -one or um, like uh, some of the uh, counseling webinars, you know, have been uh, in a group for parents, but I really feel like in order to um, enhance the school culture, um, to be more inclusive and, you know, to really um, support students at this time, there, there has to actually be like group, group, um group um support like it, it not just like okay i'm going through something and you know i'm going to go see the counselor but you know at, at different ages um and i'm just going by you know a parent's experience you know nobody wants to feel like they're singled out or look like they have a problem but we know that you know the whole community has gone through something so to me the the school needs to address it like in a collective way and not just to be like, okay, you, you, you're going through something. And so we're going to deal with this uh, on an individual basis. So I'm just conscious of time because we do have some, um, some folks outside of our committee joining us um, shortly before eight for our executive session. So um, I'll, give one more pass for final comment or question. Thank you. And um, as I, know, I know we've said this several times, but thank you again, to, um, Ms. Mills and, and um, Ms. Lord and Mr. Harrington for all the work that the School Equity Task Force is doing and has been doing and for bringing this um, presentation to, to our meeting tonight. So thank you and look forward to further conversations about some of these issues with you all. Thank you.
Um, and now we're, we are on to uh, future agenda planning. Um, apologize, I don't have that right in front of me right now. I don't know where it disappeared to. Um, I, can, I can share that if it's helpful. Oh, yeah, if you have that handy, that would be. So our next meeting, um, Regional School Committee is on the 4th of May. Um, no, 20. You're right. Yeah. It just seems so long. <laughs> we've, ne we've never gone more than a week without a meeting. Um, so on that, um, on that date, um, as Mr. Demling alluded to earlier, um, we will be um, taking up that middle school grade span report and talking about our next steps, which includes not just um, uh, not just the outreach, which is a significant portion of it, but also just a sort of refreshing hours in the community's understanding of how a decision like this needs to be made, um, because it is first a regional decision, but then understanding the the sequence of um, outreach and decision making that we'll need to make. Um, we are um, plan to have the CPAC in for their annual report um, and presentation, and I believe as um, somebody mentioned earlier, they also conducted a survey recently, um, and they are planning to join us um, for that meeting. Um, looks like we also have slotted um, the fall 2021 discussion, as well as the MSBA um, middle school roof statement of interest for the accelerated repair program, um, which is something that I think every year since I've been on the committee and probably longer than that, we've been submitting SOIs for that. Any other? Uh, Ms. Seeger. This is more of, uh, this doesn't directly relate to this, but um, I had thought there was another meeting in the month of April. Uh, so it's more of a school committee announcement, but this is then technically my last meeting with you all tonight. Um, and oh. I just wanted to mention that. So <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't think of it sooner and I'm sorry I didn't read this sooner. Um, but I wanted to note that and I'm gonna encourage Leverett to try to have somebody at the May 4th meeting because they're gonna have to regroup, I think the night before. Because um, our town meeting is I believe May 1st. So hopefully you'll have a Leverett rep then. Um, I, I know I've been here a short time, and it's been a pleasure to work with you all. It's been a very short but intense period of time. <laughs> I was about to say it was it was very short. I think you squeezed in probably at least two years worth of school committee work in the time that you've been with us. So, um, and uh, yeah, thank, thanks for letting us know. I'm sorry that we didn't know ahead of time, but I, I do want to. I'll just sort of go a little off topic. But you were um, uh, I do recall that we we um, it had some several conversations um before you joined us on on region and i think um sort of worried about the workload and even though the workload was immense um i've really enjoyed having you and i think you've been a really um productive and helpful part of our committee so i really appreciate the your service over this past very intense year and sorry to see you go <laughs> yeah thank you it's the end of my uh, six years in Leverett on the committee there. So, um, and I, I'm kind of sorry I didn't wasn't on this committee sooner. I've, I've enjoyed the experience. So, thank you all. Any other um, comments on the agenda planning? I see Mr. Dimling's hand. Yeah. I, I can't believe Ms. Spitzer is bringing up the uh, superintendent evaluation process and the, uh, <laughs> so I'll bring it up. Um, we should probably uh, set the vote for that and then reverse engineer the steps we need to do in order to get there if we're going to finish that on time this year, which yeah. we probably should. I think if you scroll down, Dr. Morris, we there's some placeholder points on there, but we do need to talk about the tool. Um, and probably need to move that artifact presentation too. I added something at least for that conversation to occur at the next meeting on May 4th. Is that yeah. sound okay, Mr. Demling? Mr. Demling? Do we still have a, an active superintendent evaluation subcommittee? Because that would be those would be the members who would more want to 
chime in on schedule. I believe Ms. Spitzer has been chair of that, and I don't know who else. It was me, I think, forgive me if I say somebody who is not actually on it, but I believe Mr. Sullivan was, was on it with me. And um, yes, Ms. Stamser. So um, perhaps we should find a time to meet. Although I, I do think it should be pretty straightforward because although I don't wanna creep into talking about the subject, but we, we may wanna think if we wanna rethink the format in light of the, the year we've had. Um, yeah. so, um, we can talk about that later. So that would be probably a good um, you know, a month between now and May fourth, if that if that subcommittee could meet, and we can we can circle back what, how we um, frame this on the agenda. But it could be sort of just how to, as you just framed it, sort of what what process and what tool do we want, even if it's not sort of the the actual tool to, um, review. Um, I think I see um, Ms. Lord's hand up. I know that we're thinking about this in a little while, but I don't know if we want to put it on to start talking about um, the idea of doing a land acknowledgement and other ways we interact and support the Indigenous community in our school and district and curriculum. Thank you. Like yeah. that be June, since we're not going to meet again in April, and May looks full. May or do you think that's too April. soon? I think if you're okay with um, land right? acknowledgement, land acknowledgement, I think it's okay to put. Because the other stuff goes in with that, so it's not performative, in my opinion. Thank you. Any other? Ms. Stancer. Um, I, I guess a question. When we do the, the 2021, let's see, I can't see it. Can you scroll back up a little bit on the document? The fall 2021 discussion, um, based on the this evening's discussion, can that include something about the mental health preparation? So I had separated them out to that being more the format of fall 21. And then I added, um, based on the conversation tonight from SETF and Ms. Kane's comment, a separate item. You may not be able to see it on May 18th. Ah, uh, okay. It was about mental yeah. health and well-being of secondary yeah. students. Thank you. Because I think I think they're two different things, and I agree they're related, but I actually think looking at them separately might be beneficial. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Any other um, comments or ads? Ms. Lord, did, is your hand up again, or is it no? Okay. Great. Okay. Awesome. Um, Moving on, um, uh, warrant report. Ms. Spitzer, do you have any warrants to report? I do, um, just one. So um, I, Carrie Spitzer, authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $66,963.31 for the warrant dated April 2nd, 2021. This included general fund expenses of $31,937.03 revolving fund expenses of $12,771.44, grant fund expenses of $21,287.34, and other funds in the amount of $967.50 for capital. And I signed this on April 2nd, 2021. Thank you. Um, next up, we have um, accepting gifts, and I don't believe there are any gifts this evening. Um, so with that, um, I am going to make a motion that we enter into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation of APEA. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body and the chair so declares, and I declare, with no intention of returning to open session. Is there a second? Second. Uh, moved by McDonald and seconded by Spitzer. We'll take a roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Ms. Kenny says aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. 
Ms. Seeger? Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer? Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan? I can read your lips. Sullivan, aye, and McDonald, aye. Um, so the motion passes unanimously. Um, and so we will now move to executive session. Thank you to Amherst Media for uh, broadcasting our meeting this evening. <laughs>